Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be asking the question, is it time for a Vatican III? Yeah, we're going to look at the history of ecumenical councils, and we're going to look at the hot-button issues that the church is facing right now that would have to be addressed in a third Vatican. It's my alarm. Oh, yeah? It's time for Vatican III. <laughs> Man, back in the you Catholic studios, Ryan Shield, Father Rich. It's kind of an interesting topic. Yeah. I've got a lot of questions, but you know, um, what what kind of stuff are we going to be diving into today? So we are going to look at what ecumenical councils are. So everyone knows that Vatican II and Ephesus and you know all the councils. I see you. They're yeah. called mm -hmm. councils, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at those, and we're going to look at some of the things that are happening in today's world that would warrant another church council. Uh, it's been 50 plus years since Vatican II and with the pace that society and the church is moving and, and issues are, are jumping up. Um, I would suspect that it's really time for a third Vatican council. It yeah. really what's, is. A, what's a synod? Synod is. Cause I mean, that's what they had like a synod. Yeah. A synod is more where the bishops come together and they're discussing something. It's not a council where it's making large binding decisions for the entire church. For the universal all, church. Yeah, yeah, where it's all the bishops coming together. Okay. Um, there may be pastoral pastoral need that right. arises for a region or, you know, pastoral considerations like celibacy that was brought up in the recent synod. Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to a council, you're really, the Holy Father is calling the cardinals and the consultors and different task forces to begin to look at. A synod is more consultatory. It's, it's, it's consultatory, but in respect to a council, he's receiving counsel from all of the bishops, all yeah. the cardinals. And in a relationship. synod might be like a pocket of something and a that pocket may be of people. more regionally driven, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like okay. the, the priest crisis in the Amazon or, you know, uh, different different things that, that are more regionalized. Um, not that it doesn't have an effect for the universal church, but it's looking at larger issues that are facing the whole world. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, the actual word ecumenical council, I mean, we know what council comes from, but ecumenical comes from the Greek term, uh, Greek term, uh, ecumenikos, which means from the whole world. And that really was in the early church when there was, or even, you know, the church throughout the ages, if you look at Trent or, or if you look at. Uh, Jerusalem. Well, that was the first one. Yeah. Ephesus. Um, Ephesus, like a lot of the early or ones the Lateran, were amazing. You know, the yeah. Lateran councils. It was when all the bishops of the world came together to discuss and settle very grave matters oh, that yeah. the church was facing. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened with Vatican I, where the church was facing a lot of... Uh, were they calling them councils back then in Jerusalem? So and then the like council, the early... the, there, it's attached to it, but but so the, it seems like it the seems council like they, it of seems Nicaea, like... I think, was probably the the first one to be considered well, like actually a council. So the Latin Church, the Roman Catholic, the Western Church considers the Council of Jerusalem, which is in the Bible, as the first council, right? And that's um, that's in the Book of Acts where they get together all the bishops. So it's Peter and Paul and. Uh, James, they get together and they discuss the issue of what to do with uh, Gentile, Gentile converts, right? That yeah. was the first council to deal with this. This was the first but issue. But the Council of Jerusalem is more looking back at Scripture and naming it that. So the actual... But, but it, it was but a in, natural thing, but and in then it practice, was named something. Mm -hmm, but right? in practice, mm -hmm. that is exactly what a council was. All the bishops got together and addressed what does a pagan convert or a Gentile convert need to do, and it's well, do they need to be held to the law? And some people said yes, other people said no, and they finally decided that uh, Gentile converts do not need to be held to the law of Moses, but they need to restrain from um, eating meat, um, sacrifice towards gods, and a couple very specific things, um, and that they, they were not allowed to continue with fornication and idolatry, but they were not held under the law of Moses. So. The West holds that as the first council. The East calls that the proto-council, which would be the 
I guess the template for councils going forward. Right. Well, so they both what we're saying it. is just like it's it's almost a human um, element of organizational right. coming behavior. together, praying and yeah. discussing and asking for the Holy Spirit to guide. Yeah. You know, That's how the, we have scripture. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know. So the first seven councils are the ones that both the East and the West and almost every legitimate Christian denomination in the world accepts as having set doctrine. And those are uh, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Ephesus. Uh, Chalcedon, Constantinople, the third council of Constantinople, and finally the second council of Nicaea. Those are called the first seven ecumenical councils. And those are really accepted by Catholics, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Church of the East, like the Assyrians, Anglicans, Old Catholic, more or less everyone accepts those, okay? Now, but in the Catholic Church, you know, there are 21 councils that we accept where the East doesn't accept all of them, okay? Yeah, because of the schism. And looking through some of these these councils, you know, some of them were pretty close in time, too. You know, like the first Council of Lyon to the second Council of Lyon is 1245 to 1274, You've got other ones like the Council of Constance, 1414 to 1418, and then just a few years later in 1431 to 1439, the Council of Basel and Ferrara and Florence. So, and the reason why I'm bringing that up, even in the 16th century, Fifth Fifth Lateran Council was 1512. The Council of Trent was 1545. Well, the Council of Trent was such a powerhouse that they didn't. But, I mean, really, if you look at the history of the church, it's every— 50 to 75 years, a council comes mm-hmm. up. And I think that's kind of the life cycle of the church that... I think those councils that were really close by, they're like, hey, man, did you not attend the last council <laughs> and understand what we were talking about? We no, need a to lot get of times that was thing. it. That, that the, <laughs> and, and honestly, I think that's where we're at with Vatican II. Because yeah. Vatican II... Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, it could be, yeah. Look, I'm not one of those guys, but Vatican II, its application has gone... Application Incred- is just like the interpretation of what, yeah. what it just it has. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I love the church. I love the Pope. I'm not one of those people who says, well, after Vatican II, the church is a new church or whatever. Never that, met that's, one of those guys. But what I find interesting like is the Council of Trent, which, as you described, is a powerhouse of a council. Right. Without a doubt, definitely one of the most uh, definitive, definitive yes. of, of all of the councils. And this is, you know, post-Reformation. A lot of things to talk about, right. clearly, and they did. And after that council from 1545 to 1563, and we think of 1565, the landing of of uh, Father Lopez in St. Augustine mm-hmm. and the established colony in St. Augustine, uh, the first city in the, yeah. in the country of the United States. Um, but from there, 1563 all the way to 1869, First Vatican Council, right. that's... That's that pretty long, impressive. That was a long run, and that's because Trent was awesome. Yeah, it's, and Trent addressed everything. Trent was the counter-reformation. So, and that's a good point to bring up is that each council really is called to address typically very specific issues and heresies and controversies in the church. So, for example, the first universally accepted one outside of the Council of Jerusalem is Nicaea, and that was called by um, called by Constantine. Um it was all the bishops, and that was to address the Arian heresy yeah. and for setting the day, date of Easter, yeah. right? Um, like the Council of Ephesus, that was called to address um, the nature of Our Lady and whether or not she was the Theotokos, right? The, the, the mother true mother of God. Of God. Um, you'll have like a Chalcedon, which was called to, to, to define the doctrine of the two natures of Christ, you know? So each council is called really to address an issue. Yeah, they call, they're they called out of need. cultural... Out of need. Yeah, need for the church to explain, mm-hmm. you know? Um, what was Vatican II called for? I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you? Is I asked you the question. Yeah, it, I, I, I was like, know. why was that called? It was more of... It was Modernity. liturgical liturgical reform... Church in the modern world was was a big big issue. Um, you know there were there were a lot of uh, pressures of modernity and innovation that, that had to be covered. You know, like I look back at uh, Papa Buono. I mean, you know his social justice teachings and yeah. But are those were those really necessary for a council, or was that really 
more of a synod or a meeting or just even a papal document. Well, yeah. even before that, like these synods or these uh these councils, they they take a long time. They take years at a time. Yeah. It's pretty ex- like, you know, for a a shepherd of a diocese or a cardinal or whatever to to leave their flock to do this, it's kind of a big deal. It mm-hmm. really is. You mm-hmm. know, and they go for a long time. They're back and yeah, forth like, all like the time. Vatican it's II a serious was, commitment. Vatican II was three years. Vatican yeah. I was a full year. Uh, Trent was, oh, man, Trent went that from really 1545 long. to 1563. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, yeah that 18 was a long. years. They weren't all, I mean, they had to take breaks. You know, no, they were in a room working for 18 <laughs> years because that's how awesome our bishops used to be. Uh, but look yeah, at that five true. cardinal legates, three yeah. patriarchs, 33 archbishops, 235 bishops, seven abbots, seven generals of monastic orders, and 160 doctors of divinity. Yeah. And really, I think wow. the Council, that's of, Council of Trent, the Council wow. of Trent was addressing the church coming out of. I guess the post uh, medieval era, and also it was the modernization of the church uh, in in that new reality. But also, it was specifically for the Counter Reformation to address the heresies of Luther. Right, and, but the whole thing too with that is if they were so corrupt, which obviously was the the impetus for all, all of. Martin Luther, well, his perceived right. right. Yeah, it, 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 Martin it, Luther it, just wanted to get strange on the side. And was also kind of argumentative. Well, whatever. whatever but he he was reacting to a lot of. Uh, he had some know, legitimate gripes, sure. Right, I'll, right. I'll give him that. But he was still he still. But I mean, a we heretic. had some bad popes in history, and they were all in that period. So what I'm saying is, like, you got the guys from divinity in there. You got the you know bishops and everything, or the you know cardinals. I mean, some of those guys were probably not. You know, well, but, the most, but you look at the, the fruit, most righteous. You look at the fruit of the Council of Trent, and you cannot tell me that that was not guided by the Holy Spirit. The I, Council I do of that. Trent, I do is, that, which is why I'm saying the this. Council of Trent saved our church. Which is mm-hmm. why I'm saying this because it's in it was in a time of like right. serious combustion. You know, there's like ruminating, and so you're looking at it and going, "How did that come out of where the church they was were? fracturing all over Europe?" Yeah. And that council brought it back together and said, this is how we're going to keep it together. And recalling, you know, maybe 15 years ago or 16 years ago when I was reading through the Vatican II documents, I, I don't recall anything that I came across as absolutely egregious where you're like, yeah. oh, my goodness. Like, yeah. No, they spent a lot of time and effort. And I think Papa Buono, especially himself, won the social justice issues that he faced. But he was one of the most ecumenical popes in the history of the church. And his sensitivity to ecumenism and relationship with the Jews was a very, very big deal for him. Mm. And then, you know, in relationship to Paul VI, the church in the modern world really contextualizes, you know, how are we going to reach the people of this generation and how are we going to address that? Issues of humanae vitae after the after the council and a part of his, uh, you know, so there there were needs for the council. Now implementation of the council and how people how people took advantage of this shift with cultural with, with yeah cultural things. implementation yeah. that may not be associated whatsoever mm-hmm. with documents. You know, with big the, old fat guys in Rome that eat look, linguine and one of the worst things that you could do is not admit mistakes when they happen. And to continue to defend and go down a path, but I will not say that Vatican II was a mistake. No, but but it's rule out, and the way it was implemented was, and it just was the interpretation. I mean, let's not dress it up and and you know try to cover it up. The way it was rolled out was bumbled. Period. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good in Vatican II in the documents, and the actual documents themselves are not at all what happened. But no one. In, in honesty, can look at what happened after Vatican II and say that it produced the desired result. It did not. We had declining attendance at church, confusion everywhere around the church, massive upheavals in liturgy with no uniformity, um, and so many other issues that rolled out of it that despite the intentions of what it was trying to accomplish, it did not accomplish it. I, I truly believe we're walking on very, very thin ice, judging a generation that one, we didn't grow up in, and two, we don't know what they were facing. So we're looking at a time where there was the hippie revolt, there was the sexual revolution, 
There's a lot of concerns in the world uh, with war and, you know, post, uh, you know, that, or excuse me, World War II, yeah. the Cold War, communism, all of these, all of these powers and these realities that the, that the world was facing. Madonna. And, <laughs> <laughs> and not our blessed Virgin Madonna, but that <laughs> Madonna. That was later. <laughs> but, but to, to just kind of uh, categorize Vatican II and especially the implementation of it and do a blanket, uh, you know, um, this is it. Well, and, yeah. and, just, and just say it was it was crap. So, no, I, 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 but let me finish this, Shield. That's not fair to the men and women who implemented the actual documents and really, you know, from the social justice elements for uh, the rights of women, the the uh, invitation of activity in ministry by the laity. All of these things are fantastic things. These are great things. Yes, could they be ha, abused? Have they worked? No. Yes, they could be abused. Have they worked? See, but that's that's an I, old, I that's a generalization. Yeah, yeah, it is a generalization. I, and, like, I, and I, it's not a generalization. It, if you look in, at... In we, pockets, they have worked. In, in pockets, pockets but they have in, worked. But look in, at, in at other, other pockets, view. it It is the, the whole sense of the dignity of... Vocations, of the, attendance, and catechesis, belief in the sacraments and the true nature of the sacraments has plummeted so precipitously right, that but, anyone but you're could attaching so that where to is a, the vocation boom that we're facing now where where did that come from it's from why am i a priest Paul why am i a priest people, today the people and, and is he not a vatican II priest yeah is john paul ii not is, is benedict not a vatican II priest yeah. Be- Benedict Both was of very those boys were writing in, in that in those were. in that vat. And I like I said, I'm it. not talking about <laughs> the documents themselves. There is a lot of good things in those documents, and a, and some things were good. Like I am not one of those guys that say we need to go directly back to the Latin Mass. I love the Latin Mass, and that's what I attend. But that is not a feasible option for today's church. That is that may, it going. Ripping the Band-Aid off and saying, okay, we're going from Latin to your language, that works. Putting the pan, ripping a Band-Aid off and saying, we are going from the language you know to Latin after a generation doesn't work. And, and that I would, I would agree with in relationship to the stark, massive cultural shift where now there is absolutely no Latin. Right. Now we're throwing in brand new music that nobody's ever heard and the theology of that music and the material of that music was very, very different than the ancient hymns. Mm-hmm. All of that is jarring, and it made the church suffer, for sure. Yeah. But if you read the documents themselves, they didn't say of to do that. they didn't say and to do that. they actually so you, encouraged the use of, you know, the of Sanctus, Latin. of the Agnus mm-hmm. Dei, of the Mysterium Fide, all of these different expressions within the liturgy to maintain and retain Latin. I yeah. still do it in, in my church now. What you're not accounting for is that there was, and this is an American phenomenon, by the way. This is not like worldwide. You have the, you had this rebellious culture that... The, the, this is not an this, American phenomenon. This is all over the world. Look in no. Europe. Europe is worse off than we are for, after Western, Vatican II. Western phenomenon. Western culture. Okay. okay. It's, it's sure. a Western I'll phenomenon. Yeah. All right. So this this church council was for the, the for the West universality yeah. Yeah. universality you you mentioned that earlier yeah. so I mean that's what it was for right so you know it speaks to everybody and, and it, it does it in such a way where it can all be applied through the culture so you got this culture who's literally just like extremely rebellious and for whatever reasons I wasn't living in it you know I've, I've obviously you know been sickened by it you know as a person who grew up as a next generation right. Mm-hmm. And, and didn't have catechesis and fell away and, and I'm not, you know, blaming stuff, but yeah. So you look at that and it's just like, what, what's the, what's the deal with that? Right. The deal is, the deal is, is that, yeah, you, you're, you're putting something that's good into a poisonous toxic culture where they take things all to themselves in rebellious nature. Then they start producing like liturgical music with my little pony. Right. You know what I mean? Like I'm saying, I don't think that the documents or the intent themselves were bad, but no. I am I am very clear on what happened after Vatican II. But it's cultural more than it is our church yeah, but our and those res- documents. But we bungled the response from using the documents of Vatican II. We bungled the response Dude, that we planned for that. You give a hot dog to a two-year-old, she's not going to eat it. He or she's not going to eat it. It might fall on the floor. Mm-hmm. The intended purpose is there. 
but it it doesn't really just it doesn't. Well, you really... don't give a hot dog to a two year old then, and that's what we did. Oh yeah, you do. Okay, well I got six kids. <laughs> you, give, you give a hot dog to a two year old. We got to cut them up, otherwise they'll choke on it. No, no, you give a hot dog. Well, maybe yeah. three. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> but no, the, the, the point dog, is please. the point is that I understand what I'm you're saying is that dog, the culture please. took this and took it in unattended ways. But all I know for certainty is that after Vatican II in that generation. Church attendance has precipitously dropped. Belief in the true presence in the Eucharist has dropped. Vocations have dropped. Churches have closed. The faith is not where it was. And I'm sorry, was anybody, it? anybody with a, even just a, the numbers are there. The numbers yeah. are there. Even with just any uncritical look at it, you cannot deny that what happened after Vatican II has been disastrous for the church. That I will concede. That's what I'm saying. Not, I will not concede that Vatican II, these documents were positioned in such a way. No, where, I'm not saying that. Or, or, that the count, or that the council itself. We have to remember okay, that, boomer. that in, but in this period of time, we had, you know, like the, the, the hippie they, revolt. We yeah. had all these things that I mentioned before. But it was the world was in a traumatic situation, and it was a mess. The world was a mess. Look at all the sex the abuse. Look at all been the sex mess, abuse. Though. No, but look at the scandals that we're facing now. A greater majority of these scandals came out of that period of time too. Right. And and no wonder people were walking away from the church in in droves. But we've always had scandal. We've always had issues. We've, and know, that's what councils try to address. Address, and they have always they've nailed it in the past. They have. Look. The Reformation, or the Deformation, depending on how you like to look at it, Trent cleaned that up, right? Yeah, Ephesus and then after cleaned that, it up. They just completely executed that in a perfect way. Well, that, they didn't, and the of course they did. They did. Anathema, that's, that's what I'm saying. But anathema, didn't need anathema sit like that's going to that's going to bring the Christian community back together. Like, dude, we're well, still what we're after still Trent. fragmented. But look at we're, well, we're a true. human. We are a human. Human group of men and women in the church that are trying to implement the teachings of Jesus Christ and the teachings that would drive us to a greater unity. And counsel is necessary for that. Yeah, every council can be criticized. The Council of Trent did not accomplish what it set out to do, right. which was to bring all of these, you know, fragmentations back. Because it's humanity that they're delivering this to. Yeah, but the Council of Trent <laughs> provided years of stability afterwards and the ground bed for countless saints and for and devotion then, and the world to, for the church and then to the grow. the impetus for what is now 50 to 60,000 Christian denominations. Look, so all, I look back no, at the Reformation the did that. back at Vatican II and you're like, what do you got? You oh, got that's what you got. Okay, boomer. <laughs> so no, but I'm 43. Yeah. Yeah, but you're thinking like a boomer here. The Council oh, yeah, of Trent. 44. The Council of Trent addressed the issues of Protestantism and the church, the results were the church grew. Every time the church has had a council, the church has grown after it, besides Vatican II. Period. You cannot okay. argue that. Okay. So I don't. I don't know if I. I would agree with that entirely because okay, again, no. And 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 uh, you know, I don't, don't think I'd have my. Well, can faith you name if it one council Vatican where the church too. shrunk after that council? Can you name one? Bro, Reformation, man. The, the church, church absolutely like shrunk. The uh, the size of the ch no. The Reformation had already happened. Correct. So the this council like, didn't fix that. But the church grew exponentially out of Trent. <laughs> Afterwards, it exponentially, did, it did. Period. Yeah, well, you need to bring these facts to the next thing over here. Yeah, but it did, bro. Th what what we are discussing in in a very argumentative way is which is a, kind of fun. It's, for a, it's our a council. Every now and then. Is a, is a council. Yeah. And this is we're we're having council, right. and we cannot sit there and express. Like, granted, we need clarity of teaching. We need. Uh, right. the, what are the, elements? the magisterial teaching power of the church to direct us. Yes, Vatican II provided great clarity of how we ought to move forward on many issues that were very, very good. Now, if it gave shrink to the church, that, that's, that is a jump for me. I'm not going to sit here and say that they are immediately they, connected. Well, now, if you can't see the direct correlation between the, the decline of the attendance in, in the church after Vatican II, you're, you're lying yeah, but, to yourself. Yeah, yeah. You just are. I'm no, sorry. It's, it's not that I'm lying to myself, but you're, you're not taking into account materialism, relativism. 
um, you know, communism, all of these persecution, other political systems. Arianism, Nestorianism, Protestantism. This is the only council that shrunk the church as a result. There's always been an ism that the church has addressed, and Vatican II didn't get it. That's why, boys, I think we're having this episode because we probably need a Vatican III to clear this up, right? With, without, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And, and, I believe we know, do need a Vatican III, and because, like I said, I don't think Vatican II was fundamentally bad. Their documents are awesome. There's a lot of amazing things in there. But after it, it shrunk, and that's it a did. phenomenon. And you can, but you can't still, point back to that. And that's all Those I'm saying. Documents, it's, they're, they're not it's not the world, documents. It's yeah. worldwide. I think that's the same what same I was trying here. to say. It is worldwide. So, well, right, the church so. exploded after the ex- church exploded in many areas of the world. After that, there is more. Ch- there is. What were people doing with their suffering, bro? They were. They were. They were, they were taking drugs, psychedelics, all that, but these that's other in types. America. We're looking at this through an Americanism lens. But throughout the world, the church exploded in Africa, in Asia, opium in in, and throughout the East. And then, you know, cycles through all over the world in Europe. This is is not unique to America. This was a world worldwide issue. I I think right here, this is exactly what happened. Should happen in councils. People should be airing stuff out. Now, before we get into what we think should be covered at a third Vatican council, why don't you tell um, everyone how they can learn more about us and talk about our sponsors. We want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Exodus 90, as well as Hallow. Exodus 90 is a great program out there for all men considering taking the next step in their faith journey with other brothers. They spend 90 days living austerely and praying and performing different acts of penance and austerity. Now I've done this experience. Cold showers aren't too bad. And praying through Exodus can only give you a greater sense of an impetus to break through the chains of your own life with other brothers, finding greater freedom in the prayer life. We also want to recognize our sponsor, Hallow, a great application that has quickly become the number one prayer app on the App Store. So be sure to check out Hallow, and there you'll find all these beautiful prayers that they've uploaded from daily meditations to rosary to scripture, Lexio Divina, and so much more. These young people were inspired by the applications like Calm that are out there, and this helps people calm down and meditate and center their thoughts. Well, this is a great form of meditative prayer in the Catholic tradition that's being driven through an application. Hallow creates a wonderful sense of our Catholic heritage of prayer and they have just about everything and they're continuing to expand their product as time goes on so be sure to check them out and if you do visit their website and use the promo catholic talk show and you'll get premium contact for, for content for 30 days and by using that you'll be able to explore their full capacity of what they're offering so be sure to check out hallow a great app for prayer all right thanks for that padre so let's get into it. Let's actually get into, we talked about the past councils. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about is what should Vatican III or the next council actually try to sort out? Because there is a lot of issues for the church right now. I mean, well, one we can all agree with that. Right? One thing's very, very clear that there's points of contention that are very, very vibrant, even in our conversation and thus far. Real friends. Yeah, and, we're, and, and, and the beauty of council is that we can come together despite our difference and hash things out and, mm-hmm. and discuss them in depth because we need to figure out where we can move forward to a greater unity. And that's what the church council ought to do uh, in effect. And we do need to return to those councils so that that is effectively done. Is this the first Catholic talk show council? <laughs> we should have a Catholic talk show we council. Should. The first Catholic talk show council happened in Napa over a bunch of booze. That's, that was the first one. That was the proto council of the Catholic talk show. But I, I think uh, liturgy is a, a great point of contention. I think between uh, you know people who still uphold the tr- the traditional right, which is beautiful, by the way, and I which still those... use traditional rites of blessing when I when I do blessings. And I still re I still kind of uh, get into some of the more traditional rites of the church just for my own edification as well. Yeah, and I go to a there parish such, that in, integrated this into the parish life, and it's been amazing. It's such a rich treasury. So I think liturgical reform has to be 
the item that would be most important and most important. Interesting. I, I do because there is such a there's such a division in relationship to these factions. Because I mean, even even amongst us, like absolute bros, right? Yeah. There's there's real. I don't I don't want to say division, but uh, differences in opinion that have the potential to really divide the church. I mean, if you look at, you know, traditional parishes, they're growing. You look at parishes that are much more novice order centric, those are shrinking. And th those are statistics. Numbers don't generally lie. Um, but can the church just wholesale go back to, or would it go back to uh, Tridentine mass? I, I don't think it should or could, you know? So what kind of liturgical reforms can the church really do to, Maybe this is like it's when you a, release a new software and the first version has bugs. And if you're looking at Vatican II, there was some bugs in that rollout. You release a patch to kind of fix those right, bugs. I right. think that's a that's, better approach. That's a good analogy. You know, to yeah. what Vatican III can cover, cover liturgically. And, and not that this discussion is going to fix some of those no. bugs, but I think... You know, when it comes to the sacred treasury of music that we have, you know, in, in our possession as as Catholic Church, when it comes to the, the beautiful hymns that we have passed down uh, from age to age that are timeless, when it comes to, you know, the, the expressions liturgically that have just great beauty. And, and, and the efficacy that they brought out in the true belief, in the, the belief in the true presence, yeah. the biggest issue, the reverence. look, the biggest issue that church is facing is the lack of belief in the true presence and everything flows from that. And the liturgy can accomplish that through and the its liturgy, pra the, proper practice. Yeah, the liturgy or... is the battleground for the true belief in the yeah. true presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love Ad Orientum. I, I remember when I first saw it, you know, at Ave Maria and... Uh, Father Fessio celebrated with his uh, his back to the congregation, but facing the altar. I had this overwhelming experience of the nativity scene. You know, we're we're all gathered and we're focused on the altar, but the altar for me at that moment, prayerfully, was like the nativity scene, and we were all facing Christ, which was which was beautiful. It makes sense, just you know, that we as the people being led by the presbyter. Are worshiping God and when, in the same motion yeah, and the same towards movement. Yeah, liturgical yeah. East, You know, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I think our our generation can be criticized because of you know, oh, you want to go back to a church you don't, you never lived in, or you never experienced. Right, but yeah. experiencing that and some of the traditions of the church, you know, granted, I I didn't live in your generation, but I have a lot of love for it, and I really find it to be very very beautiful. And on top of that, you know, celebrating Ad Orientum on behalf of, of the community would create more of a focus, in my in my opinion, for the person who is celebrating in Persona Christi. Yeah, yeah and then absolutely. you've got people that are priests that don't do that, but when they do celebrate Mass, the reverence is seen in their face. Mm -hmm. It's seen in their... So it's a little bit more difficult because the, post, the posture of that is not oriented towards it which gives you sort of a, a default, but you know, there are some, you know, priests that I've seen celebrate mass and, and the, and them holding Christ in the Eucharist is like, it's very powerful because you see that countenance. Yeah. yeah. You mm -hmm. see that and, and you're drawn to it because their focus is there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, it's but right there. You said something and it is beautiful, but you're focusing on the priest's face when right. you should be focusing on the Eucharist. No, and no, no I think no. that to me, where you 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 always have the tendency and the nature towards the very best in people. You yeah. do that. You're very you have that love and good will towards people, uh, and but you also have the proper orientation and you have been formed well enough that you see the love. You see the reflection of the Eucharist in the priest's face. Well, too many people see the priest's face and miss the Eucharist. Yeah, and that's the issue that not celebrating. Well, I think the, the other thing is just the way that the mass w is celebrated in those particular instances that, yeah, I, it can draw you away from that. I mm -hmm. think there's another side of that. Right. So, so not only liturgical expression, but also liturgical space. And I had this Thank awesome you. experience. I was at the cathedral uh, in Savannah, Bishop Lassard's old mm -hmm. stomping grounds. Yeah. And when 
I was doing a wedding rehearsal just recently. I went on my honeymoon to Savannah. Oh, really? It's yeah. a beautiful city. If you, Savannah. If Savannah's any awesome. of our, yeah, if any of our listeners or viewers, if you've never been to Savannah, it's worth the trip. It's it's a beautiful place. But I'm I'm sitting there and I noticed these three guys in the back, and you know they were kind of sprawled out across the pews, tattoos all over themselves, and you know they're making comments throughout the the rehearsal. So when the whole wedding party went to the back by the baptismal font. I went over to them and I said, "Hey guys, what do you think of this? What do you think of this church?" And they're looking up and around and, and they're like, "Father, it's it's beautiful, man." And I said, "Yeah, I just I love this place. I love coming to this cathedral. It's so prayerful. The environment's so pretty." And and the guy looks up and he's like, "Father, I I worship in a warehouse." And the other guy <laughs> said, "I worship in a mall." And and they were expressing like, "Wow, I wish my church." had this had this Beauty. environment yeah. and you know we went through a shift of time where we started constructing churches with poor materials and with a lack of ornamentation with a lack of what is greatest for God and we should be outfitting our parishes in ways that exemplify the beauty and the splendor and the radiance of God as the people royalty. walk in the yeah, royalty I, yeah i think a third vatican council definitely needs to address liturgical spaces and really codify that because going forward into the future, there is going to be such um, competition for the eyes and for the the beauty that people see, right? And the church to continue to grow and to continue to reach people into this ugly future that could be a force. Be, could, that's going to continue to be more digital and more disconnected and more um, isolating. isolating Having these enclaves of beauty and unity yeah. through beautiful churches is going to be one of the most effective evangelization tools of the 21st and 22nd centuries. Yeah. And addressing that in the th uh, our proposed Third Vatican Council, I think, is absolutely critical. What do you What do you guys think about like cloning? Is that a thing right now that that should be brought up? Is that oh, has it brother. progressed? Cloning Cloning has to be and human sexuality and generativity. Is, is what's human generativity? So just the the natural uh, way in which men and women come together to have children. When a Creativity. man loves a woman, right? When a man, let me let me break it down like this: the birds and the bees. Would be when right a now. man so, uh, a woman loves has, a woman, yeah, a woman has a socket, Sing right? It. And a man is like a plug. And when they come together, it creates something. Okay, Jeez. it's electric. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. so you you bring up some issues, and I think these are issues around the nature of the dignity, the fundamental dignity of the birth and life of a person from a biological level. So we're talking about cloning and biomedical issues that the church, as technology... It separates it. Well, as technology advances, there is going to bring up some seriously ethical issues that the world will need the church's guidance in cloning in, um, I don't want to say, I would say selective genetics where people are going to have designer babies, right? Where the natural process of... Procreation is going to be tinkered with to such a point where it's going to be unrecognizable. I mean, even with, as, even with animals in God's creation, they're still. And, but it's know. happening now. It is. Yeah. It's happening right now. And we need to look at this very closely and we need to study it because there's, there's really no sociological studies being done on the implementation of these biological things, um, even even when it comes to the use of technology and social media and and um, the online space and augmented reality, virtual reality, all of these things, there's not social studies being done about or these things. Or the church hasn't even thought about how to really approach and address these things pastorally. And it's going to need to, right? I mean, when we get... I mean, they've addressed it in some ways, but not formally. You know, they've and, had a meeting and they yeah. have a two-day conference and a couple of scientists come in and they're like, hey, we had a conference and then everyone moves on. Yeah. There has not been a forceful addressing of really, look, what is going to unfold as technology advances. Do you know, I, I love Archbishop Hurley, you know, who in, the, who in the 50s, you know, traveled around the state of Florida and with developers... 
this is where we are going to be developing the state of Florida. And he goes around and he purchases property for the sake of the church as a visionary to, to say, okay, this is where we will develop mm -hmm. the Catholic faith in these various developments. He Beautiful. worked with experts in the field. Right. And, you know, just to have a conference in the Catholic church where we're serving ourselves and we're talking internally without these experts, bringing them in and working collaboratively with them with technological development we need to operate at that level. It opens a dialogue up where you're involved and you're bringing morality and ethics and different things into like, that space. Yeah. That's the most important thing that the church has done throughout history. Mm -hmm. And we, we have kind of turned into this kind of navel gazing in different, in different ways where we host these conferences. Yeah, that's, that's great. But how many, how many priests universally or, or priest representatives. Can you name any of them? Like, it's hard to do that. I don't think a rank and file Catholic even knows these things happen. No, they, they really reading, don't. Unless they're reading like page four of the National Catholic Register, which who knows actually reads that, right? They're not seeing that the Vatican held a conference on the ethics of biochemical, you know, engineering. No one knows that, right? No. Um, and what's so, the results of it? What's the implementation of it? What is the Catholic to believe and, and, and to, guidance? And to put it very simply, I've had so many conversations because of working on my second master's in media and all that stuff. His second master's, he's rubbing mm. it in. Uh, the yeah. divinity thing, you know. You know like, but no, but like when, when Bishop asked thing. me to go study for communications, you know, I've talked to so many of my brother priests, and these are guys that are my age. Where I'm like, you know, what do you think about social media? What do you think about website? Blah 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 blah. You know, evangelization through these through these different methods of of technology and, and communication. It? Yeah, they don't see an importance of it. Yeah, I really think that a third Vatican Council that one of the fruits of it could be the creation of a religious order that is specifically and its whole charge is the evangelization and the care and pastoral needs of people in the digital space, because as di technology advances, we're going to have, you know, yeah. AR, VR, and things that we can't even comprehend now, and having people on the forefront of that um, is incredibly yes. important. Yeah. Now, yeah, I think a lot of people get, like, uh, because they don't know about something, they just kind of turn away from it and just say, you know what, I the, don't know. You know, and, and and you're like, oh, we we should say yes to everything, yeah. even if you're sta even if it's darkness that you're going into. It's like, how do you bring light there? Mm -hmm. So, a couple other things that I think a the next council really needs to address, and this is a really big one, and this is kind of a more nuanced thing than I think most Catholics would understand is synodality, and this is to my mind maybe the greatest risk facing the church in the next hundred years, and synodality is. What is the structure of the church in going forward as far as the role of the bishops versus the role of uh, of Vatican, the role of the Pope, the role of the rank and file priest? How does that hierarchy actually work? Because you're, you're seeing now, like in Germany, they're trying to create a synod that can then pass a German synod, a German synod like that can pass fundamentally changing doctrines to what the church teaches that apply for Germany. And they're saying, well, we are in charge of addressing the German flock, so we are going to do this. And there's things like we're going to have a, basically a democratic process for establishing church doctrine that involves lay people voting along with the bishops, and then it's almost going to be like that. And it's like That would be absolutely this is detrimental. Disastrous. Oh, my gosh. Right. And again, we've, you know, this is Cardinal Marx pushing this, and again— I've, I've, I remember reading that all bad theological ideas start in Germany, and this is a bad idea because what you're going to have is a lot. You're going to have what happens in the East with all these national churches that then excommunicate each other like Constantinople ex, you know, and Moscow broke off, and then you're going to have Bulgaria and Ukraine, and every country is going to have a national church, and they're not going to be universal. Synodality is a horrendous idea as to how the unintended consequences can play out. And I think Vatican three needs to address that and like say what synodality is, what it is and what can happen. What and can what happen. is the red line that yeah. if you cross right. this, you right. are busted, you know? Yeah. You're, you're, you're basically like you're running away from the universality of the church into some sort of pocket of your own. Right. And, and there's a distinction to be made on the, the kind of the, the crosshairs of subsidiarity and universality. Right. 
Subsidiarity is very important. Of course it is. That's why we have national bishops. What's subsidiarity? Exactly. So it's always looking for the most local solution to a problem, yes. essentially. And and yeah. that is that is important because we we work with different cultures, different people, sure. and how we proclaim the word and how we distribute the goods of the people are going to be uniquely driven. Mm-hmm. And you need to be able to have that in subsidiarity. But two, we need to be governed in a universal manner by way of theology and philosophy. Right. The magisterial teachings of the church and the the role of the Holy Father and the cardinals are very important to the overall That's the structure so, set up. Yeah, absolutely. So you think there's lines that are crossed between subsidiarity and oh, theological? Oh, yeah. oh, oh buddy, yeah. all the time. Absolutely. Wow. So, And you're going to see that even more in like where... For example, a local church like in Germany will say, we are going to allow communion for divorced Catholics, divorced and remarried Catholics. Well, that's not applicable anywhere, but they say this is our pastoral approach. That is a line too far. That is something that... Look, and that's I think a national subsidiarity, that, theologically that need, that, speaking. That's a definitely major problem. needs to happen in Vatican III. Yeah. It does. They need to squash this and define these are the lines. And if you step over it, yes. you lose, uh, ipso facto, the ability to make that proclamation. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, and I think when we talked about liturgy, that's the same thing, that there needs to be a more standardization of liturgy throughout the world, as well as what synodality means so that there is, again, that universality that we had for so long that we really have lost in kind of this modern world that has expanded globally at such an incredible rate that it's hard to keep up. The expansion is rapid and our growth in, in every respect. We're moving so fast and our kids are moving r- even faster than what we moved. You know, like you think about our these- kids, <laughs> our kids. Well, yeah. Well, let me make make a make let a me point. be very clear, Bishop. They're kids. He does They're not kids. Our kids. kids. But our children culturally and, and, our children's and, children. and the generation yeah. that we're that we're looking that we're that we're raising. It takes a village. It takes a people to raise the the children that are entrusted to us. Well, they're moving very very fast, rapidly, mm-hmm. and you know we don't have the structures and the delivery of reaching these children with the messages that have been entrusted to us. We need to we need to clearly have a distinct path for our youth ministry efforts. Digital continent, yeah, the, like, on the digital I mean, continent, it has to happen. Sixteenth evangelization you know? on the digital continent has to be one of the most important. There needs to be bishops for that. Space. But, but we we said, all need orders. to be on the same page, and and yes. in every you know th- there needs to be a religious order that's formed. You structure it to address it. You structure Maybe it. That's what God's you calling you, Padre. Oh, buddy, I I will do anything that. Holy Mother Church asks of me, and I will I will serve Christ to, with passion and love yeah. in anything. I, I, I love the space. Um, I, I don't like being on my phone or on, on media constantly, but um, I see the need, yeah, yeah. and I'm willing to sacrifice. So a couple yeah. other issues that I think, again, that Vatican III needs to, or the next council needs to uh, cover. Um, this one's kind of like uh, the synodality is in the... In, Renewed investiture controversy. Now, what is investiture? That's who has the right to name bishops. This is very scary. This is very scary, too. And we had one of them, uh, Pope Gregory Hildebrand, right? He dealt with this uh, with the Holy Roman Empire, you know, long time ago. But it's rearing its head again in China. China is the world's most populous country. And China has basically usurped the right to nominate which bishops or who can be a bishop and the authoritarian um, dictate that the church has to have these bishops or these kind of bishops is such a threat to the sovereignty and the free practice of the faith that barely anyone knows about. And that is a scary proposition that governments, um, and as the world moves, I would say more towards socialist thinking, which is terrifying you're going to have more socialist governments and more of those socialist governments are going to demand certain bishops and governments are going to, again, push and infringe on the rights of the church. And that needs to be stomped out immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's terrifying. 
It, it's it's terrifying. So where are they naming bishops in countries now? Are they doing China, that? China. In China. China. Okay. They were mm-hmm. there was basically two churches in China. There is the I think it's called the PRC. Uh, and that was the Catholic Church that was officially approved by the state and they swore allegiance to the to the communist government ahead of the Pope. And then there's the underground church, right? Which is kind of the pure the purer church and the Vatican made an agreement with China, which I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it, where they said, we are going to essentially, the Vatican is going to recognize the bishops that the communist government of China propped up as the bishop, the Catholic bishops, and that China going forward allow, is allowed to nominate who is going to be the bishops in China. Yeah, if I was the Pope, I'd be like, Holy look, I'm backing out. John Paul II Done. was like, no freaking way. Really? He would. He stood so oh, firm yeah. against that. Because well, he came out of communist, right? And he saw country, the underground yeah. Chinese church as so similar to what he experienced under communism. Yeah, and and under it's control. Nazism it's control. And yeah. that we rolled over for China. I mean, what are we? The NBA? Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's for you. I knew you threw that out there. For me. <laughs> so that that it was shocking and terrifying to me, um, and and I understand it. It was a. The concept is try to have an olive branch towards this massively populated country so that the church can establish a relationship with it. But goodness, that that's is a recipe branch. for disaster. Yeah, it is. It's not an olive branch. It is it's not, not. It's no. not coming from the Holy Spirit. Well, I think that's the most important thing that you just said, Ryan, is that it is the Holy Spirit that dictates through the discernment yeah. of the college of the bishops and conciliar conversations that will direct the path of the church, right. not and the governing powers so of the world. That's why it's yeah. so important. To it, have the church like is a sovereign nation unto itself, and that's the governing power of Christianity that, that people are starting to recognize across the bounds of ecumenical divides. People are seeing the central authority that the sovereign nation of Christianity in the Catholic sense, the Catholico sense, yeah. Uh, this is universally applied. Absolutely. And this draws all men and women to greater freedom. Yeah. And the church is a, it, 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 it's, it's head is, is the victim, the victim of Christ. And it's mm-hmm. like, now you're like not victimizing, you know, you're not, you're not being the victim you're in the spirit. So what is the olive branch then? If, right. if, if that's, the if that's the case. suffering. Yeah. There, thank you. That's it. That's awesome. That's, that's exactly it. That's the olive branch exactly. becomes the crown of the martyr. Yes. Yeah, and God and like, being willing to right, enter it. into that state, and God will prune it and grow it. Uh, and let's I, talk. But, let's talk about something that the Third Vatican Council can do that maybe isn't so contentious. Something maybe a little bit happier, and that would be the proclamation of a fifth Marian dogma. Mm-hmm. So there's been two councils that specifically established the first two Marian dogmas, which was um, Our Lady is the Theotokos at Ephesus. And that the perpetual virginity of Our Lady at the Council, the Lateran Council. And then we also have the Immaculate Conception and the Dogma of the Assumption, which were both um, done by, you know, papal document. What's this one going to be? Medjugorje? We know that he'd like that. The, the, uh, but co-redemptrix. 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 Would yeah. be the one. And, and that, that, that. Identi- anything for Our Lady, any oh, title, man. any additional title we give Our Lady, I'm, I'm as long as it's within the propriety of good theology. But yeah. co-redemptrix, I do really think is, and it's not saying that she is equally responsible for the redemption of human beings, but it is. But she participates in it perfectly, in a perfectly and uniquely powerful way. She, in her role, was able to participate perfectly in the redemption of human beings. And of all peoples. Mm-hmm. And it's our lady. Come on. We got to mm-hmm. get something nice out of this Vatican III. It can't Moms. just all be me yelling I'm at a you mama's guys. Boy. We're hot blooded <laughs> Italians, man. We the are blessed mama's mother boys. for us is yeah. everything. We've shed tears over that. It, yeah, it's our love and awesomeness. Uh, yeah. Um, and but to I, think I, about the blessed mother for a moment, her fiat is so great that she was led to the foot of the cross of her only her son, yeah. where he died on the cross. And the movement itself was confronted with such a violent end, and that just a, shows her the Jewish heart of a woman like the Blessed Mother, what she must have suffered, but the resilience of her heart that she was willing to gather those apostles 
and participate, and participate in redemption. In the, and, and, and in that sense, they gathered in one accord around her and the church was born, mm. you know, at Pentecost, she, she did not have this adverse feeling toward justice and the movement of truth. Yeah, that, she participated in it perfectly. That upper room wow. became the, the second womb of Mary that birthed that, wow. that movement. You know? Yes. That's amazing. It is. All right, so, I mean, there again, there's so many things that are facing the church that need clarification. So at Vatican III, there's other things that obviously I think could be addressed, like um, how how the church addresses uh, homosexuality in, in the holy orders and ordination. Very important to cover. Um, uh, a, a very clear and unified stance on abortion and how to go forward in addressing that. Uh, the role of... Of, of, of women in, in the holy orders and definitive statements on there cannot be women priests or women deacons, um, how the church is going to address. Oh, wait just a second that there cannot be women deacons. Yeah. So, um, in relationship to that, John Paul II already spoke definitively, so there's really no need. Yeah, but for you, a you see that debate still happening. But women priests, right. but the the diaconal ministry that's rooted in the history of the church, where women has have exercised a function yeah, sacramentally the, exactly, in but baptism. That's not, the, that's not the diaconate that we see today. Correct. And I mean, but I, I think, but I think that. that's I think that's where we need to underline and say, look, my the daughter, diaconal the diaconal ministry itself. What is it? What is it? Exactly. And is what it a, needs right. to be clarified that's, in that yeah, space? That's is bigger, important. That's the that's bigger, a bigger, bigger issue. issue. There you go. And and because of the lack of priests, because of a lot of other things. Correct. Are and in. and you know the administrative function, the the aspect of service. What does service look like in the church today, whether it can be performed and upheld as a faculty being driven by a man or a woman in history, there have been men and women deacons. So all of those things need to be discussed and, and clarified for us. Um, confirmation, a uniformity of the application of the sacrament of confirmation. That is a sacrament without a theology right now. That is all over the place. And uh, I think a, unif or a universal... A universalization of how confirmation is applied and celebrated needs to happen. True. We need to talk about syncretism, right? And what is, you know, the, is there truth in other religions and how does the church address that? Which, you know, only the Catholic church possesses the charism of the fullness of the truth. But how do we... How do we use that as a evangelical tool going forward? And, and how can we learn from the Jesuits in the 16th century right. and enculturation? And some of those things are, are rooted in Vatican II. But if you look at the history of all these different councils, there are a lot of overlaying things mm -hmm. that are readdressed right. and, and refocused. Uh, we can also talk about uh, proselytism. Is it still proper for the Catholic Church to actively try to convert people of other faiths? And I would contend absolutely but so many in the church say that the age of proselytism is ended and to actively and to seek to convert other peoples of other religions is viewed as wrong. But I mean, we should be actively trying to convert the indigenous of the Amazon as well as the Buddhist, as well as the uh, Jew, Muslim and anybody. Taoist doesn't matter. We should be actively trying to convert and proselytize and is it's there different. a space for that? It's, yeah, and it's different too with the secular nature of our right. Western culture. It's just like it's a, it, approaching that is is even something that should probably be considered. Mm -hmm. How we approach scientism and this this unbalanced view that science is dogmatically um, superior superior when science doesn't address it. Science addresses how is not wise and how to properly evangelize in a culture and a society that is going to be increasingly influenced by science and how the church addresses that and keeps up with it, but continues to show that there is the metaphysical side and the theological and philosophical truths that are just as true as one plus one. So how we do that. Now, the last one I think that we should discuss is really, though, the reunification of the church and people who are outside of the church, particularly the mainline Protestant branches, and especially maybe my heart's deepest desire for the church is the reunification with the East. Mm -hmm. There is nothing greater that the church can do 
I believe, because all of these, a lot of these other things would be addressed by necessity in the reunification of the East unica- and the West. I mean, what does the unification look like? I mean, it's just like a bunch of guys who are patriarchs and the hierarchy of the church going, hey, yeah, we agree with you. But no, no, I, no it, I, means, I think, it means eating at the same table communally yeah. as communion, uh, as receiving the sacraments without distinction between the East and the West. Mm-hmm. That is massively important. I, I think that is the most important thing. And I've been praying for the unification of East and West ever since I read materials on John Paul II that, that shared those same sentiments. And I've, I've, committed myself through the intercession of St. Nicholas of Bari um, in that same regard of, of praying for the unification of, of East and West. One of the most overlooked things that, uh, that Pope St. Paul VI did, you know, he's tied to Vatican II or Humanae Vitae, but the mutual lifting of the excommunications between him and the uh, ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople on the wow. Mount of Olives is so criminally underlooked at how monumental that was mm. and that there has not been more progress made is so an impetus for a lot of it, it has dialogue and of it. the current arch uh the, the current patriarch or ecumenical patriarch of constantinople bartholomew he's a good guy he's he's someone that the church can really work with and i think there's an opportunity for that right now and you know, there's already talks where Francis and Bartholomew have have spoken about considering having a meeting um, near Nicaea or Ephesus, I believe, in celebration of the one of the centenary celebrations of the councils. And look, with the schism between Moscow and Constantinople that recently happened, Constantinople and the the historic church and the the um, the primate of the East, really, they're in need of more support. And this is now more than any time in history when the East and the West can reunify. There's really very little holding us apart at this point. That's what I was thinking. So, boys, East and West side, let's just make that happen. (laughs) That would be wonderful. There's nothing more that I think would make reparations to the wounded heart of Christ than the reunification of the East and the West at the next council. And just make it happen. I don't care what you guys need to do. Figure it out. Make it happen. I think that would be the greatest success if that can happen. If you that need would a fifty-year council, the greatest council. success of any council that we're we're reflecting on today during this episode, that would be tremendous. If, yeah. No matter what it takes, if it takes fifty years and you guys lock yourself at one place, like honestly, I don't even think Vatican at this point can hold the council. It probably won't be Vatican three. It'll probably need to be held at a different site, just logistically of having. 2,000 bishops there, you can't fit them all in Vatican City for five years. It wouldn't work. So let's go back to Nicaea. Orlando, the Bishop of the Moon can host him. <laughs> the convention center. The first council of Montana. There's plenty of room there. <laughs> but yeah, that's the reunification of the East and the West is, it's, I believe, imminent. It's possible and it should just happen. Mm-hmm. No, in all seriousness, Africa, man. We should have it in Africa. Yeah. Africa I'd, unite, man. Yeah. That yeah. would be cool. They really would be. And it would be so perfect of a place for the reunification. Mm-hmm. You know? Or in Jerusalem would be. Jerusalem would be cool, too. That'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. So before we, I think, look, I think maybe we all agree that there needs to be a third Vatican Council. And there's a lot of issues facing the church that we need to sort out. I think out. it's time. Yeah. I think it's Do you time. you know what else time it is? What's that? It's time for the Inquisition. Ooh. Ooh, I haven't uh, had an Inquisition in a while. Yeah, yeah. bringing it back. We're, We're bringing, bringing it back. back. This is considered retro. Now. Yeah, this is no. This is <laughs> this is tratty Catholic talk show. We're inquisitive. Oh no! Inquisitive minds want to know your Inquisition question. What is, is your question, sir? In another council, in the next council, mm-hmm. what is the best action the church can take to address the true and egregious difference between? traditionalists and modernists. That's the, that's the biggest threat I think in the church in the West. Mm-hmm. What can the church do to fully reintegrate the, the, the mass of the ages and the traditional Latin mass, the Tridentine mass without abandoning the, 
I guess, the goals that Vatican II tried to accomplish. How can there be a true... How can Vatican III serve as that patch to fix what Vatican II... So you're asking, you're mis- asking me for... Misapplied. We want you to solve the world's problem. Yeah, solve the problem. Yeah. And if, you, and if you don't, you're yeah. locked off with that head. Um, how, do, how, do, how do we properly, in a next council, bring tradition back without abandoning what was attempted in Vatican II? I think Pope Benedict started the process of the conversation with the motu proprio. Mm -hmm. But I believe that we need to be more accommodating ritually within our universal approach. So not only with the traditional right of, of our faith, which we need to accommodate and make available much more greatly. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm, How do we do I'm, that? I'm wholeheartedly, <clears throat> for example, I'm, I'm building, I'm in the process of, of, you know, beginning a campaign, moving in the direction of building a liturgical space. We need to build liturgical spaces that can essentially provide for the proper celebrations of these rituals of history. Mm-hmm. And not only just the traditional rite of the Latin rite of, of, of our faith within the concept of, of the designs of a liturgical space of a church, but why not the, the Byzantine rite? Why not the Eastern Orthodox rites? Why not all these other rituals of the Catholic church? And to be able to house those in liturgical spaces, I just had an Eastern Orthodox family come to mass this past weekend. And they said, father, we just moved to town. There's really no church anywhere close, like an hour and a half, two hours. And we really like being here. We're, we're discerning if God is calling us to be, to be a part of the church. Well, in my heart of hearts, you know, I respect their right. And I, I would want to be able to house that liturgy in that church congregation, especially if I had a community that would merit. So you're that, saying like that multi, pastoral need. multi-purpose churches that can accommodate the, you know, Byzantine, the Ukrainian, Melkite, the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian, the, how, but how could any church properly address that? I mean, the, the, space wise, spatially, yes. Spatially, there has to be, there has to be a creative way to be able to design a liturgical space to be able to accommodate to those needs. There, you, you have them now with the Novus Ordo that's being celebrated with the high altar behind mm-hmm. in the, in, in those respective celebrations. If it's the Tridentine rite, it's going to be celebrated at the high altar. Do you think the Tridentine rite needs its own <sighs> To be its own particular right in the church, we do. I, I do think that that would be a, a very good way of approaching the service to that community, mm-hmm. and by accommodating them within the scope of universality, that's the way to do it. And in, in my humble opinion, I'm not. I'm not. But moving forward, and like the Trinitine right is, they're building their own church, and then the Novus Ordo so church the, is building their own church. And, so would the Novus Ordo right just be? Can the continuation of the the Latin right in the church and the older order now becomes its own, like the Melchites or the Ruthenians? Absolutely. I I don't see the I don't see a problem with that. And I, and even as a, as a priest, if I had a community that that were calling for the Trinitine right and I was serving that community, I would personally learn the right as well as any other right for that for that matter. If that is if that is the form of worship that roots down to the apostolic core of who you are identity wise as a Christian, that's my obligation pastorally to be able to serve that need. Yeah, I think the just like the um, the ordinary at churches, which honestly, if the Vat- if the Second Vatican Council had just done the liturgy like the ordinary at churches do, we wouldn't be in nearly the mess that we are. They. It's the perfect balance between tradition and modern accommodation with the vernacular. But having a tra- a Tridentine rite that is its own distinct rite or its own distinct uh, church within the, the universal church probably is a direction that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I, I say we celebrate that wholeheartedly. You know, and, and free try the Latin to, mass. well, you absolutely free the Latin mass. And that's what Pope Benedict was moving in the direction of. And I just think kind of went backwards the last few years, It did, but you know, I, I think that's the way that we need to go because it, we can't force the grassroots movements of devotion and culture that is within the true subsidiarity of the church. 
We need to celebrate that and give allowance for that. As long as it's orthodox. Maybe it's time to just recognize that the Latin rite has split in two between traditional Novus Order, and there is now two rites Mm -hmm. where there used to be one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. But bring them fully and properly as their own distinct rites that are equally valid, but equally celebrated. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. With great devotion. That's, that's how I would answer answer that question. All right. So why don't you tell everyone how they can uh, sign up with us and get notification when the Third Vatican Council happens. <laughs> <laughs> if you want tickets front row to Vatican Three, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and certainly visit us at catholictalkshow.com. There you could subscribe, and we'll send you emails with new materials that are... That are, <laughs> are you eating lasagna? During the show, <laughs> a front row seat to watching Delacross eat lasagna right now. It's late. He's hungry. But visiting the CatholicTalkShow.com, you'll see all the ways that you could listen in or view our content on YouTube. On YouTube, if you hit the subscribe button, make sure that you click the bell so that anytime that we produce a video, it's populating in your feed so you won't miss anything that we produce. We want to give a big shout out to our patrons. Patreon.com forward slash the Catholic Talk Show is your way to support us financially to make sure that our show continues to provide these types of conversations to many, many people around the world. We thank you for your generosity and we thank you for your time journeying with us during this uh, special content talking about Vatican III and possibly some of those conversationals, uh, those conversations and, and councils that would take place. But we're interested to find out what you have to say, too. What are some of the other items that you see happening in the world that are happening even in your local church that need to be addressed? We're interested. So let us know. But make sure that you let us know in the spirit of charity. And just like we had our conversation, our very passionate conversation. We're about to get in a fight off screen. Yeah, we'll get in a fight off screen, but we'll hug it out afterwards (laughs) because it's all about brothers, brotherly love, you know, and and living our faith in, in truth and charity. So hey, yeah, we're we're over here beefing on the, the Third Vatican Council. He's like, "Where's the lasagna? Where's the lasagna?" <laughs> Maybe you know what? Maybe we should just follow him. I think he's right. Let's go get some lasagna. Let's go eat some lasagna. Right, see you next time. God bless. See you next week.